right so um, we are we are discussing meromorphic functions okay and uh, uh, we were uh, looking at uh, uh, meromorphic functions uh, on the extended plane in the last class and uh, in the last lecture and you know and we proved that uh, uh, the a function which is meromorphic on the extended plane is none other than a quotient of polynomials okay namely a rational function okay so uh, what i need to what i want to tell now is about the the collection of meromorphic functions on a domain okay you take a domain in uh, the extended plane and look at the set of all meromorphic functions defined on that domain okay then that set has a has a nice structure in fact algebraic structure it is a field okay and in fact it is an algebra uh, over the complex numbers okay and uh, so the so it is a field extension of the complex numbers and the, and the and the properties of this field extension algebraic properties of this field extension they have got they capture uh, a lot of topological and geometric properties of the domain okay uh, so uh, this is how uh, there is you there is a link from you know from the uh, complex analysis side to the algebra side okay so you know geometry involves uh, an interplay of various areas of mathematics so geomet studying something geometrically will involve studying it from the anal analysis viewpoint okay and studying it from the topological viewpoint also studying it from the algebraic viewpoint but when you are looking at a particular nice object okay the when you study it analytically it will have some properties okay some special properties and then when you study it algebraically it will have some properties special properties when you study it topologically it will have some special properties and the fact is that these properties are interrelated it is there is some beautiful relationship hidden relationship between these the analytic the algebraic and the topological properties of a nice object and that that relationship is what you may call as geometry okay so if you want to really understand the geometry of an object you have to analyze it using all the three uh, you know viewpoints algebraic analytic topological okay so in that sense you know how do i do geometry on a domain in the complex plane or in the extended complex plane okay what i can do is uh, of course the analysis is there the analysis uh, will worry about what kind of functions you can define on the domain uh, what are the holomorphic functions or analytic functions on the domain what are the uh, meromorphic functions on the domain and so on that will that will be the analytic that will be the an uh, viewpoint from uh, analysis but then how do you go to algebra okay the point is that you take the set of meromorphic functions that forms a field okay and that is a field extension of the complex numbers and you study the properties of this field extension okay so in in field theory you have lot of uh, you would have come across in a in a course in algebra uh, uh, in field theory uh, that field extensions have there are of so many types okay there are algebraic extensions there are transcendental extensions and then there were there are normal extensions there are splitting fields there are galois extensions okay and there are of course separable and non separable extensions and we study all these things and of course the most important thing uh, uh, here in general is the study of the uh, nature of galois extensions because that connects up with group theory which is uh, uh, it connects up with uh, the so called galois groups so uh, so you see uh, the moment you look at the field of meromorphic functions you get an extension of the complex numbers and then you can do algebra okay and somehow uh, these things are all connected and i'll try to give a couple of examples okay so uh, so first of all let me begin by first saying that if i take a domain in the extended plane then the set of all meromorphic functions on the domain is actually a field okay uh, so so let me so let me write that down uh, uh, the field of meromorphic functions so uh, let d inside the c union infinity be a domain so you are taking a domain in the extended complex plane 
C in infinity. Uh, so, in particular mind you it is a non empty uh, open connected set ok and uh, the, the advantage of taking a, a domain in the extended plane is that you can also look at the neighborhood of infinity ok that is the advantage. So, you are in also including the point of in at infinity right. So, uh, uh, let uh, so here is the notation I will put script m of d be the set of of meromorphic functions functions on d ok. So, what is this script m of d script m of d is the collection of all meromorphic functions on t and you know what a meromorphic function is we have defined a meromorphic function to be a function which is analytic at all points, but except uh, for uh, <coughs> points on an isolated sets which, which have to be pole singularities ok. So, uh, it is analytic except for poles and the moment you say analytic except for poles it means the singularities can be only poles and that in particular means that the singularities can only be isolated because poles are isolated singularities by definition ok. So, uh, so you take you take all the meromorphic functions on the domain ok. Now, the fact is that this is a field ok. See uh, so, le so let us see that let f let f and g uh, be uh, meromorphic functions on d ok. Then you see uh, then you can notice uh, the following things number one uh, if uh, lambda is a complex number ok then lambda f is also uh, a meromorphic function ok. Multiplying a meromorphic function by a constant is going to keep it meromorphic ok. Of course, if the constant is 0 you will get 0 and the 0 is uh, a constant function and of course, you know when you say meromorphic analytic is also included. Okay. So, the definition for meromorphic is that it is analytic except for poles that does not mean that it has to have a pole it can be it can have no poles and it can be analytic everywhere. So, holomorphic functions are also included in the uh, set of meromorphic functions ok. So, uh, so you know so the first so this statement is obvious if I take a meromorphic function multiply by a constant if the constant is 0 of course, I am going to get the 0 function which is which is holomorphic which is analytic because it is a constant function ok. But if lambda is not 0 lambda times f will also be meromorphic and it will have the same poles ok by multiplying by lambda you are not going to change the poles and uh, you are not going to change the order of the poles there is not uh, essentially uh, uh, you are just multiplying by a constant ok. So, uh, uh, so, this is so this is uh, one obvious thing then the second thing is uh, uh, the second thing is that if you take the sum of these two meromorphic functions uh, this will also be a meromorphic function ok. The sum of f and g will also be meromorphic why because you see uh, the fact is that f is meromorphic. So, it has some fine it has uh, a collection of poles ok uh, at an isolated set of points then g uh, is also meromorphic. So, it has uh, also poles in another isolated set of points and then you take the union of these two isolated sets that is again an isolated set ok. Uh, and these are the only points where f plus g will have problems ok. So, uh, where at a point where f does not have a problem and g does not have a problem f plus g will not have a problem that is at a point where f is analytic and g is analytic f plus g of course, will be analytic ok. So, uh, the only problems for the function f analyticity of the function f plus g will be at the points where f and g have problems ok. And it is possible that some of uh, some of that there could be some cancellations ok. So, you know for example, f may be 1 by z minus z naught g may be minus 1 by z minus z naught. So, if I take f plus g I will get 0 which has which does not have a pole at z naught ok. So, some po see some poles can cancel out also and sometimes uh, the order of a pole can come down ok when you add of course, when you when I say add it also in includes subtraction because uh, subtraction is just adding with minus 1 multiplied by the second uh, uh, function ok. So, so the moral of the story is that the sum of two meromorphic functions is again a meromorphic function it could very well be analytic ok. Uh, some poles may cancel out all the poles may cancel out for example, if you take the function and you take its negative and add it you will get 0 and that is clearly holomorphic it is a con it is a constant function. So, so sum is meromorphic 
So, you know the, the moment you look at the first two things this will tell you that you know m of d is a vector space over complex numbers see because it is you see uh, 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 so there is a scalar multiplication if you think of complex numbers as scalars then there is a scalar multiplication and there is addition. So, this is a, this becomes a comp so m of d uh, uh, is a c vector space. So, you get that immediately ok. Um, now, uh, let us look at let us look at f times g look at f times g see f f multiplied by g will also be a meromorphic quantity this is also very very clear because it just from the fact that you know uh, what are the problem points the problem points are the points where f has problems and g has problems ok. So, if you take out uh, uh, those problem points then f times g will be analytic. So, at a point where f is analytic and g is analytic f times g will be analytic and the only place where f times g will fail to be analytic is probably on the set union of the set of poles of f and poles of g ok. And uh, uh, so, you see uh, uh, and of course, you, you if you want you can write out always the principal parts uh, uh, and uh, see that you know uh, uh, if if a if see if two functions have poles at a at the same point at a they have a common pole then if you multiply the product function will have a pole with higher order in fact it, it will have order equal to some of the orders that is obvious if you write out the principal parts ok. So, in the Laurent expansion all right. So, uh, so uh, I mean the point is that you know all these algebraic operations of ad adding, uh, subtracting, multiplying by a constant multi and just multiplying and of course, we are going to see division all these things uh, they do not change the meromorphic nature ok. So, by adding or subtracting or dividing or multiplying or multiplying by a constant you cannot change a meromorphic function into a non meromorphic function you know if you are only working with meromorphic functions you will get back again meromorphic functions ok. So, uh, fine so you have uh, f and g are uh, uh, the product f times g is also meromorphic of course, by product we are one means point wise product ok. So, f g is a function which at each point z is defined by f of z times g of z all right. Then, um, then of course, I can say the same of uh, uh, f by g this is also a meromorphic function. Uh, provided uh, uh, g is uh, not uh, not identically zero, okay. Of course, I should not divide by zero. Uh, so, so the fact is that see when I take f by g, okay, what are the problem points? The problem points will be poles of f, poles of g, and now you'll have extra problem points at zeros of g because they are zeros of the denominator. They become the zeros of g will become poles of f by g they are likely to become poles of f by g and of course, you know it might happen that some zeros of g may cancel out with some zeros of f because the zeros of f are on the numerator the zeros of g are on the denominator some zeros might cancel, but the set of problem uh, points are just uh, the poles of f the poles of g and the zeros of g okay. and these are this and you know uh, uh, the zeros of an analytic function are also isolated you know that that is a theorem ok. In fact, that is a that is another version of the identity theorem. If you have seen it in a first course in complex analysis, so so therefore uh, the set of points where f by g will have problems is still an isolated set of points. Okay, and at each of those points, you can only get poles. You can't get anything worse. Okay, so it's so therefore f by g is also meromorphic. In particular, I could have taken one by g. I can put f equal to one. I'll get one by g is also meromorphic, and that means. Uh, so, what will I get? I will get 1 by g is meromorphic if g is not identically 0. So, that means every non zero meromorphic function, every meromorphic function which is not identically 0 has an inverse, ok. And that is what you require for a field, ok. A field should be uh, basically a group under multiplication if you throw out the 0 element from the set, ok. So, so well, if you uh, um, if you look at all these things, these things will tell you that m of d is a field and you know you put it together with this fact that we saw earlier we have seen just above that m of d is also a complex vector space of 
a field extension uh, which uh, a field which is also a vector space is an algebra okay. So uh, basically you, you can very well see that m of d contains complex numbers because the complex numbers sit as constant functions okay. You take any complex number lambda you think of it as a constant function lambda, constant function lambda is analytic it is defined everywhere so it is analytic on any domain okay. And it is meromorphic because mind you when I say meromorphic I am allowing also analytic or holomorphic. Meromorphic means that it can either be analytic and if it is not analytic that is if it has singularities the singularities must be only poles that is what it says. So meromorphic does not say that it should not be analytic. So in particular m of d contains the complex numbers as a subfield uh, you know the complex numbers of course form a field and uh, therefore m of d is a field extension of the field of complex numbers. So m of d is a field so let me write that m of d is a field ex extension field extension of uh, the field c of complex numbers and uh, the beautiful thing is that uh, the geometry on geometry on the domain d is done by uh, uh, the uh, a lot of topology of the domain D uh, is connected to and a lot of uh, uh, analysis on the domain D namely the behavior of existence and behavior of meromorphic functions on D is connected with the algebraic properties of this field extension okay that is the geometric content okay. So uh, I mean this goes back to uh, uh, the work of uh, the classical giants like uh, Riemann and Clifford and Weierstrass and Abel and Jacobi and you know all these people who developed uh, the theory of Riemann surfaces okay uh, of course principally fr fr from Riemann. So, uh, so let me write that down so, so let me let me write it out in a as a diagram so you have m of d and this is over c so I am I am using this I am using this field theory uh, you know uh, uh, notation you write a field uh, a bigger field uh, on top and you put a smaller field in below and then you put a vertical line saying that the thing that comes above is a is a field extension this the things that come below are subfields okay. So uh, this uh, so the the algebraic properties of this field extension the algebraic properties of this field extension. Uh, they are connected so there is a there is a uh, so the analysis on d which is uh, existence existence of uh, special existence and, and properties and properties of meromorphic functions. functions on D that is the analysis on D okay and this part is the algebra on D the algebra on the domain is actually studying you may think of it as studying the this field extension and then there is the topology of topology of D the topology of the domain D and you know uh, uh, you, so I am not I am not trying to be uh, uh, very particular uh, or trying to go into detail but topology at the minimum for example d is of course connected but one of the simplest things that you can look of look at is whether d is simply connected or not okay and then uh, or uh, if it is not simply connected you can see uh, uh, you know uh, if it is multiply connected and how many holes it has and so on and so forth okay. Uh, after all d could be uh, something like a uh, something like an amoeba <laughs> something that looks like an amoeba okay with some holes. Uh, after all an open set can look like that and then uh, the topology worries about whether it is simply connected if it is not simply connected how many holes are there and so on and so forth okay. So uh, all this topological information for example is encoded in the in the fundamental group uh, of D and so on and so forth okay and, um, yeah, and in, in fact more, more precisely I should say that uh, 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 you have to study the theory of covering spaces of the domain D that is what uh, the topology of D means. So, so let me write this here the theory of covering spaces of D uh, uh, related 
which is actually related to uh, uh, the fundamental group, uh, in fact subgroups of the fundamental group of the fundamental group uh, group of D. Of course, you know the, the uh, so you know uh, at this point let me tell you that uh, if you have done a uh, decent second, co second course in topology, see there is something called covering space theory which takes a topological space uh, with decent properties for example, something that is uh, housed off uh, uh, locally, uh, housed off connected, locally path connected, lo locally simply connected okay. And then you study what are called as coverings of topological coverings of D and then there is a there is a Galois theory of coverings which says that you know there is a Galois correspondence uh, between the coverings uh, and subgroups of the fundamental group of your topological space okay. And in fact under this uh, under this Galois correspondence uh, the the you know the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, 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 so this, this Galois correspondence is an analog of the Galois correspondence that you have in field theory. See the Galois correspondence in field theory gives you a correspondence between field extensions of a given field and subgroup of the Galois group, subgroups of the Galois group. Okay, and th there is an analog. So uh, so the Galois correspondence in field theory is a correspondence on the one side between field extensions. Uh, and on the other side between subgroups of a group and in this case it is the Galois group okay. So, it is a connection it is a connection between field theory and group theory okay and it is very useful because lot of field theory problems can be translated to group theory problems and lot of group theory problems can be translated to field theory problems. In the same way the covering space theory is, uh, is very very similar what it does is it translates topological coverings which is topological data into subgroups of the fundamental group. So, it also connects to uh, topological uh, side, the topological side to the group theory side, okay, so that you can use some algebra in your topology, okay. So that is why usually this is a part of uh, usually a first course in algebraic topology, okay. So, <coughs> of course, all this is very uninteresting if D is simply connected because if D is simply connected, then your uh, you know uh, your uh, the fundamental group is trivial, okay. But then uh, it is it is still not so easy, in fact. Uh, uh, that is uh, 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 the, the the you know I uh, will explain why you see see this uh, whatever I have written here uh, the algebra the analysis and the topology of D I have written it for a domain D in the extended plane okay. But I am what uh, the, 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 the philosophy is that this is this holds for any Riemann surface okay. Now there is something called a Riemann surface a Riemann surface is something that locally looks like the plane okay. But globally it may be a different surface so for example uh, uh, it may be a cylinder in three space okay it may be it may look like a torus all right or it may look like an n torus so it may be it it might look like several tori which are stuck together by removing disks and uh, open disks and you know pasting the boundaries of those open disks okay so uh, uh, these are called riemann surfaces and this is these were studied by riemann okay and uh, and riemann was fascinated to note that on uh, these riemann surfaces uh, you can put many complex structures there you can put non isomorphic complex structures and you must think of a complex structure as a structure which allows you to decide whether a function on that surface is holomorphic or not okay. So, uh, Raymond found that you know uh, see uh, Raymond tried to do what we do in complex analysis on the plane on the plane what do we do we take a domain okay and ask when a function is analytic at a point okay and if it is not if it is analytic then of course you know if it is not analytic then you see whether that point is an isolated singularity and so on that is how you do the analysis. Now what Riemann wanted to do was he wanted to do this on a surface. So, he wanted to say that suppose I have now a function on the uh, on a torus okay or say even in an open subset of the torus all right. When I say open sub, su subset you take the induced topology uh, from the from R3 in which the torus sits okay and then uh, suppose I have a function which is complex value defined on an open subset of the torus when can I say it is holomorphic when can I say it is analytic okay. So, you are trying to study when a function defined on an open subset of a surface is analytic the answer to this is that you should define what is called a Riemann surface okay and there are different Riemann surface such as you can put and Riemann found that 
uh, he was fascinated by these different Riemann surface structures and the most beautiful theorem in moduli theory is that you actually take the set of all these Riemann surface structures that itself becomes a nice uh, object. It becomes an analog at least on an open set it becomes an analog uh, a higher dimensional analog of a Riemann surface which is called a complex manifold and of course it, it, it could have a boundary which could have some singular points but it is a very beautiful object. Okay. So, the moral of the story is that I am trying to say that whatever I am writing here for D, uh, D a domain in the external plane it also works for it also works for a domain uh, it also works for a Riemann surface okay. and uh, so for example in that context you know it is it's, it's really uh, 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 it is really amazing that you get lot of uh, uh, so you know if you ask this uh, so let me ask you a fundamental question. Uh, uh, the fundamental question is suppose you have a simply connected Riemann surface ok. So, the moment I say simply connected the topology seems to be very trivial because in the sense that uh, in the fundamental group is trivial. So, you do not expect anything special, but then you can ask how many uh, simply connected Riemann surfaces are there which are not isomorphic to each other ok. Now, you more or less know the answer uh, partially because you know the Riemann mapping theorem tells you. Uh, if you have seen it in a first course in complex analysis which you should have done that you know any simply connected uh, uh, open subset of the complex plane which is not the whole plane has to be holomorphically isomorphic that is biholomorphic to the unit disc ok. So, if you take domains in the complex plane ok simply connected domains in the complex plane there are only two types up to holomorphic isomorphism one is the whole plane the other one is the unit disc ok. So, now it's a it's an uh, it's an amazing fact that uh, well e even before that let me say look at the Riemann sphere, okay, which is you know we we use that to study the point at infinity where the stereographic projection. The Riemann sphere is also a nice surface of course, and is compact, okay, and you can actually make it into a compact Riemann surface, okay. Now the fact is that it is also simply connected. The sphere is simply connected, so that's also another simply connected Riemann surface. Now it's a very deep theorem that you take any simply connected Riemann surface it has to be it has to be isomorphic holomorphically isomorphic to one of this one of these three any simply connected Riemann surface has to be either it should either look like the whole plane ok or it should look like the unit disc or it should look like the Riemann sphere there is there is there are no other possibilities it is a very deep theorem it is called uniform uniformization. So, even in the simply connected space even in the simply connected case you get a very deep theorem and the theorem is very hard to prove because you have to use lot of techniques from analysis to prove it ok. So, it involves lot of analysis it involves study of harmonic functions, meromorphic functions etcetera ok and it has it has it involves lot of uh, reasonable amount of uh, functional analysis and measure theory ok you have to do uh, you have to do all this to get that theorem ok. So, uh, anyway so the fact I want to say was that now given all these uh, uh, given all these three aspects of view putting them uh, putting them together is what what geometry is all about ok. So, uh, so, so let me write here so geometry uh, of D is you know the interplay between these three the geometry of uh, of a domain is actually the interplay between the analysis on the domain the algebra on the domain and the topology on the domain and I have given you a rough idea you you know uh, the analysis on the domain is the complex analysis part ok. Uh, the, the algebra on the domain is to really study the field of meromorphic functions the algebraic properties of the field extension given by the field of meromorphic functions of the domain and the topological part is to study the covering space theory of the domain ok. And it and it so happens uh, I mean as the great classical giants uh, like uh, Riemann and Clifford and Abel and Jacobi and V. S. Strauss have, have found uh, and Clifford for example uh, that you know all these uh, all these properties all these various points of view they are all interrelated ok. So, uh, it is it is an amazing fact it is an amazing fact uh, and discovering that is what doing geometry is all about ok. So, uh, you should not think that uh, uh, you should not think at uh, a high school level that geometry is just about drawing triangles and circles and you know uh, measuring of angles and arcs and things like that, but it is really uh, higher geometry in the higher sense is actually uh, looking at the interplay of all these things ok. So, I will um, well now you see I want to give you a couple of examples. So, the so here is a here is the first example. Uh, so, here is an example uh, you take the domain to be the extended plane itself 
you take the domain to be the extended plane itself okay. So, after all uh, we, we are studying domains in the extended plane. So, take the whole extended plane that is also a domain all right it is it is uh, in fact it is simply connected because it is uh, you know it is homeomorphic the Riemann sphere and the Riemann sphere is simply connected. So, it is simply connected it is simply connected it is compact okay. So, uh, it is a very very nice thing. Uh, now, what are the what are the uh, what are the uh, field of meromorphic functions on D? Okay, uh, what are the field of meromorphic functions on the extended plane? So, you know, uh, this is an extension of the complex numbers. Uh, as we have seen, this is an extension field of complex numbers. But you know, what is it that we proved last time? Uh, a function which is meromorphic on the extended plane is none other than a quotient of polynomials. It's a rational function. Okay. And therefore, this is exactly equal to the uh, this is this is exactly equal to c round bracket z. This is the algebraic notation c round bracket z, and the c round bracket z is actually the field of fractions or quotient field of c of square bracket z. And C of square bracket Z is standard notation is the, po, is the ring of polynomials in the variable Z with complex coefficients okay. And C of Z is uh, the, uh, the, the field of fractions which is quotients of such polynomials and uh, so you take quotients of polynomials but of course you do not put in the denominator 0 anything other than 0 you put okay. So, uh, so, the, so the moral of the story is that you have very nice description of uh, uh, this field extension. In the in the case of the uh, uh, C union infinity, which is the extended plane, and usually you know extended plane is uh, thought of as a Riemann sphere. Uh, you know uh, they are isomorphic, but you can make them also isomorphic in a holomorphic sense by giving the Riemann sphere a Riemann surface structure. Okay, so often people don't uh, use. Uh, if you see lit the literature, you will see that people often use C union infinity instead of C union infinity. They keep saying Riemann sphere all the time. Okay, so um, now you can see that. What are the properties of this field extension? You see, this field extension is is actually uh, it's purely transcendental uh, and has transcendence degree one. Okay, it's purely transcendental and tra has transcendental degree one. Uh, well, uh, uh, tra the transcendence degree is actually the number of uh, algebraically independent variables that generate the bigger extension. Okay, so the bigger extension C of Z is generated by a single variable Z. And that is the only algebraically independent variable okay that one variable is enough. So, the transcendence degree is actually 1 okay uh, and uh, and it is and it is purely transcendental because that because there is no element in C z which is algebraic uh, there is no element in C z which is not in C and which is algebraic over C and that is you know why that is because complex numbers are algebraically closed they are all algebraically closed. So, so this is an exact so field theoretically this is uh, so this is called uh, uh, this is what is called as a function this is a simple is the simplest example of what is called a function field in one variable okay. And uh, 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 the beautiful thing is that now if you take any if you take any compact Riemann surface okay then uh, if you take the field of meromorphic functions on that compact Riemann surface what you will get is a function field in one variable. But the only thing is that it may not be purely transcendental uh, uh, above the transcendent uh, uh, the, there may be an algebraic part okay. So, it will be first a transcendental extension purely transcendental extension uh, of degree 1 just like this and then b and above that you will have an algebraic extension which will be a finite extension okay. So, that is how it looks in general okay and uh, well I will give you another example for that. So, so let me write this here this is a purely transcendental extension Uh, of transcendence degree 1 okay. So, uh, see the so the picture that is that is associated with this is the Riemann sphere okay. So, this is the picture that is associated with this and uh, for all practical purposes uh, you think of the extended plane as a Riemann sphere okay. Now, uh, let me uh, let me tell you uh, uh, more generally uh, 
what is it that happens uh, with something. Uh, so, let me give you an example of a more complicated case uh, uh, the so called uh, the case of so called elliptic functions or doubly periodic functions ok. So, uh, so, so here is uh, so here is what I am going to do uh, what I am going to do is I am going to take uh, so I am going to define uh, what a doubly periodic function is see uh, a, a doubly periodic function function. So, this is uh, this is the topic of what are known as elliptic functions So, this is uh, this is also an example ok. A doubly periodic function uh, is uh, a function f of z with uh, f of z plus omega 1 is equal to f of z and f of z plus omega 2 is equal to f of z where uh, omega 1 uh, uh, by omega 2 is not real uh, and of course, omega 1 omega uh, omega 1 omega 2 are uh, non zero ok. So, uh, I am I am just defining uh, what a doubly periodic function is. So, the the see the definition is very very simple uh, for example, sin theta you know is periodic with 2 pi because sin of theta plus 2 pi is the same as sin theta. So, the idea is that to the variable of the function or the argument of the function you add the period the function value should not change ok. So, what the first equation says is that f of z plus w 1 is equal to f of z actually tells you uh, uh, tells you that w 1 is a period ok and uh, the second equation f of uh, the second requirement f of z plus w 2 equal to f of z tells you that w 2 is also a period. So, uh, w 1 and w 2 are periods and the fact is that these we want these periods to be linearly independent over r. In other words, uh, what you want is that if you take these uh, if you take these two complex numbers w 1 and w 2 uh, then you join the origin to them ok uh, namely you take the vectors that they represent in the plane uh, then uh, these should be different these vectors should be uh, linearly independent they should be in different directions you know they will be linearly dependent if and only if the quotient w 2 by w 1 or w 1 by w 2 is a real number. Okay. So, this condition that w 1 by w 2 is not real is just to tell you that these two vectors are two different vectors they will form therefore, a basis of c over r ok c the complex numbers over r is a two dimensional vector space and the, the will form a basis. So, this is equivalent to saying that w 1 w 2 form a basis for c over r ok and uh, we are putting this condition in order to make sure that the that essentially you have uh, two distinct periods ok which which are in two. So, it is periodic in two directions ok. The fact that f of z plus w 1 is equal to f of z tells you that you know if you translate along the direction of w 1 by integer multiples of w 1 the function value does not change ok. So, you must remember that when I say f of z plus w 1 is f of z it fo it follows that f of z plus n 1 w 1 is also f of z for all integers n 1. Okay, because I can just use induction f of z plus w 1 is equal to f of z. So, f of z plus 2 w 1 is f of z plus w 1 plus w 1 which is f of z plus w 1 which is f of z and so on and so forth ok. So, uh, what it tells you is that the moment something is a period then all its integer multiples are also periods ok. And similarly, uh, you also have for the other so, so uh, but what is adding w 1 adding w see addition of a complex number is just translation along the direction uh, along the vector that is represented by that complex number ok. So, you know basically if I have a point z what is what is z plus w 1 it is, it is it is actually this vector. So, this will be z plus w 1 I am just translating z uh, by the vector w 1 ok. And then uh, similarly uh, uh, what is z plus w 2 I am just translating z by the vector w 2 right and that is if I add w 1, but if I add minus w 1 you know I am translating in the other direction if I add minus 2 w 1 I am translating in the direction opposite to w 1 2 times and so on and so forth ok. So, these are all so the moral of the story is that you know I basically the function uh, values do not change if you translate along two different directions 
okay. That is why it is called doubly periodic. It is periodic and the period there are two different periods okay. And, uh, and such functions are called actually uh, now you have to put some more condition on these functions. The condition you put on these functions is that you know uh, uh, to make them very interesting these points uh, 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 w1 uh, uh, these points uh, uh, which are given by integer multiples of w1 added to integer multiples of w2 okay that th they will form a lattice a grid in the plane okay and the function becomes very interesting if the function is meromorphic exactly at those points okay and th such functions are called elliptic functions and believe it or not they are exactly the functions which are the functions meromorphic on a torus at a single point okay and this is this is the beginning of uh, the so called Weierstrass uh, phi theory and there is something called the Weierstrass phi function okay which is a fundamental uh, uh, model of this kind of function and the beautiful thing is that every torus the complex structure on any torus can be controlled by prescribing such a function okay. And uh, so uh, the Weierstrass phi functions completely uh, give you. Uh, so if you want to study the various complex structures you can put on a torus, what you'll have to do is you have to study various doubly periodic meromorphic functions, which are otherwise called elliptic functions. The reason they are called elliptic is because this it's beautiful. This complex, the, the moment you put a complex structure on the torus, it becomes, believe it or not, it becomes a cubic curve it becomes a cubic curve and therefore it becomes a an algebraic geometric object okay. So algebraic geometry also comes in, geometry also comes in, algebra comes in in a beautiful way okay and, uh, and, and this is also part of a very deep theorem which says that you know uh, uh, you take any compact Riemann surface it is algebraic okay it can give it can it is just given by a common 0 set of a bunch of polynomials okay and that is an amazing theorem okay. So, uh, I have uh, so what I want to tell you is that I have given uh, uh, an NPTEL video course on Riemann surfaces and all these things are uh, explained in detail throughout the course you can you can when you find time you can have a look at that. Uh, and uh, the, the other thing that I want to tell you is that there is this book uh, that I have written uh, and uh, uh, it, it reads an introduction to families deformations and moduli. Uh, this book is uh, basically uh, available uh, as a free freely downloadable copy in the form of a navigable PDF file and it contains a lot about the geometry of Riemann surfaces. So at least the first chapter. So that is also something that can uh, be advanced reading material for uh, people who are interested in pursuing this. So uh, so let me write let me continue. Uh, so I have um, uh, also uh, f of z plus n 2 w 2 is equal to f of z uh, for all n2 in z. So, so in totality what I will get is I will get f of z plus n1 w1 uh, plus n2 w2 is equal to f of z for all n1 comma n2 in z if I if I put both these together okay. And what are these points n1 w1 plus n2 w2 they are the vertices of a grid of parallelograms. Okay. So, in fact you know if you, if you draw this if you if I draw a diagram it is going to look like this. So, I am I have this so this is this is my complex plane and uh, you see I have I have w1 here I have w2 here okay and uh, you know then you know if I draw this parallelogram then you know then you know pretty well that this is w1 plus w2 okay by the by the parallelogram law of addition of vectors if you want uh, and then then you know if I if I extend this parallelogram below then I am going to get this point is going to be uh, uh, you know it is going to be uh, w1 minus w2 okay and and this point is going to be minus w2 and if I extend it like this this point is going to be uh, w2 uh, minus w1 and this is going to be minus w1 minus w2 and this is going to be minus w1 okay. And more generally if I draw if, if I look at all these points uh, that go on uh, that I get as the vertices of the parallelograms that I get by simply starting with this this parallelogram and simply 
displacing it uh, by either uh, plus or minus w1 or plus or minus w2 okay that is by translating it with plus or minus w1 or plus or minus w2 uh, I will get so many the whole plane is covered by these parallelograms okay and uh, the vertices of the parallelograms are precisely the points which are of the form n1 w1 plus n2 w2 okay and that is called a lattice okay and uh, the fact is that you see where is the you know just to give you an idea of what is going on uh, where is the topology coming in here. So, the fact is that what you do is you 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 divide by the equivalence relation uh, equivalence relation uh, z1 is equivalent to z2 if and only if there exists n1 n2 such that z1 is equal to z2 plus n1 w1 plus n2 w2 okay. So, see this is the plane uh, this is the complex plane and I am defining an equivalence relation on the plane the equivalence relation is two points are equivalent if one of them is a translate of the other by uh, one of these grid points okay. And what is the advantage of this the advantage of this is that if two points are related like that then the doubly periodic function will have the same value at both points because f of z1 will be equal to f of uh, z2 plus n1 w1 plus n2 w2 but that is also equal to f of z2. So, f of z1 will be equal to f of z2 okay because when I apply f to this equation okay on the right side I will get f of z2 because of periodicity, periodicity of f. So, I will get f of z1 equal to f of z2 okay what it means is the function does not the value of the function does not change if you change the point by a translate by a vector which belongs to one of the grid points okay. So, uh, so if you divide by the, this equivalence relation what you will get is you will get the torus you will get a beautiful torus and you can see that very very easily you just take this fundamental parallelogram okay this fundamental parallelogram will if you take the interior every point in the interior will be uh, a unique representative in the in its equivalence class but for points uh, but the, then you will have to only identify the boundaries see if you identify the top boundary with the bottom boundary you will get a cylinder okay and then you will have to identify uh, these two uh, these two which will in the cylinder look like circles so if you identify them you will get a torus okay so the moral of the story is you take the plane divide it by a lattice like this you get the torus okay and all the points in the grid including the origin the origin is here they all will go to a particular special point on the torus okay and the beautiful thing is that the function uh, that you defined on the complex plane will go down to a function on the torus okay and if the function is meromorphic exactly at all these grid points it will go down to a meromorphic function on the torus and you know you may wonder why should I worry about why should I uh, not consider uh, holomorphic functions on the torus and you very well know the answer there will not be any non-constant holomorphic function on the torus because the torus is compact since the torus is compact if you define a holomorphic function on the torus okay you are going to get something that is uh, uh, that is holomorphic you, you can use Liouville kind you can use the Liouville theorem if you have a holomorphic function on the torus uh, if you compose it with this map that is that goes from the complex plane to the torus you will get a holomorphic function on the plane but since it is uh, defined on the torus which is compact its image is compact therefore the image is bounded so I get an entire function which is bounded and that is going to be constant by Liouville's theorem okay and this this picture also explains why the only functions on the torus are exactly uh, the functions on the plane which are doubly periodic with respect to the periods w1 and w2 and uh, the if you take this unique point p which is the image of the grid the meromorphic since you know holomorphic functions are not available they are constants the only things that are available are the meromorphic functions and then uh, uh, if you look at meromorphic functions on the torus at the point p you will get the they will be the same as the doubly periodic functions okay and uh, therefore the moral of the story is that you know if you look at uh, the uh, if you look at the field of meromorphic functions on the torus okay they are the same as the collection of uh, meromorphic functions on uh, the the collection of doubly periodic functions uh, with these two periods okay and that is a field of course 
okay mind you the do, what is the domain now the domain is the whole plane okay and i am looking at meromor i am looking at functions which are meromorphic with poles at points of the grid okay po possibly at points of the grid all right and then what i get is i get a field and what is that field that field is nothing but this field of meromorphic functions on the torus with which are meromorphic at a given point okay and um, uh, and the, and it's and 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 so let me call this torus as t okay mind you this torus be, depends on the choice of w1 and w2 okay and uh, uh, it's a different story that uh, uh, there is a lot of geometry there but what i want to tell you is that uh, well uh, i want to tell you the following thing uh, simplest uh, uh, meromorphic function function uh, on uh, c that is doubly periodic that is doubly periodic with respect to w1 and w2 is the weierstrass phi function and uh, and the and this is the phi function so so there is a there is a there is a pretty symbol for that very special symbol so phi of z is so there is a there is a formula for that uh, basically it is a formula that will tell you that it is a meromorphic function which has a double pole with residue 0 at each of those points of the grid okay. So, uh, so uh, you know what you are going to get uh, let me write that down here you can find this in any standard book uh, for example uh, Alfo's book on uh, uh, complex analysis which is a classic uh, 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 so it is 1 by z squared plus summation over n1 comma n2 uh, uh, belonging to z minus uh, uh, 0 comma 0 z cross z in fact so I should write uh, I should write it carefully n1 comma n2 ordered pair belonging to z cross z minus 0 comma 0 uh, it is uh, 1 by uh, uh, z minus uh, n1 w1 minus n2 w2 uh, the whole squared minus 1 by uh, n1 w1 plus n2 w2 the whole squared. So, this is the expression for the Weierstrass phi function which was discovered by Weierstrass and uh, of course, if you go through uh, in detail the lectures of my video course you will see how this comes about, but you can see something immediately you see that this 1 by z squared is the principal part at the origin uh, and that will tell you that you know origin is a double pole and uh, residue is 0 because there is no 1 by z term okay and then you look at each of these other terms 1 by z minus n1 w1 plus n2 w the whole square tells you that n n1 w1 plus n2 w2 is a point of the grid is a general point of the grid okay and uh, if you uh, when I write 1 by z minus that point the whole square actually I am uh, looking at a pole of order 2 at that point okay and again the residue there is 0 all right. So, as a result this already gives you a uh, you know it gives you a meromorphic function uh, which is having a double pole at each of these grid points okay and this extra term that is added here is for convergence because you know I have added infinitely many poles okay I have, I have added poles at every point of the grid I have made every point of the grid into a double pole and I am getting a huge series I want it to converge and it is only for this convergence that this extra constant term is being added okay and therefore I get this phase function and here comes the amazing here comes the amazing theorem the amazing theorem is the following that if you take the complex numbers and you take the meromorphic functions on uh, d uh, on the on the complex plane with respect to uh, w1 and w2 okay you look at the meromorphic functions uh, which are doubly periodic at w, uh, with periods at w1 and w2 okay and mind you this is the same as the meromorphic functions on the torus okay uh, which are meromorphic at uh, at uh, that unique point which I will call at star which is the image of the grid the whole grid the whole grid goes to a single point on the torus because all the points in the grid are equivalent to each other okay and they all define a single equivalence class. So, 
it is a single point on the torus. So, mind you the torus is a set of equivalence classes okay, topologically and you give it the quotient topology all right. Now the beautiful thing is that what is this uh, 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 set of metamorphic functions you know it is a field what is that field you know you know what that field is that field is just the field gen it is just the field of fractions of phi of z and its derivative it is it is beautiful and how does this extension break up it breaks up as the first uh, phi of z this is again a transcendental extension this is a purely transcendental extension uh, of transcendence degree 1 and then from here to here uh, from here to here this is an algebraic extension this is an algebraic extension because the the, the derivative of the phi function phi prime satisfies a polynomial relation with respect to phi and that is expressed as a differential equation it is a very famous differential equation and that differential equation interestingly it comes from analysis but it tells you that the torus is algebraic it tells you that the torus is nothing but a cubic curve okay which is an amazing illustration of the fact that in general a compact Riemann surface is given is algebraic it is given by algebraic equations okay. So uh, all these details you can have uh, a look at in detail uh, uh, in more detail uh, in my video lecture course uh, but this is to tell you uh, that a lot of geometry is involved by looking at the field extension given by the field of metamorphic functions okay so I will stop here.